So just a little insight on those modules. So there are about four bales of uh, cotton uh, of Sapima, 500 pound bales in each of those modules. Well, one of the beautiful things about this technology it is, al is it allows us to pick and harvest that cotton at the optimal moment. It used to be that it sat out in the field until you had a, uh, a cart that you could harvest the cotton from the field, put it into the cart, and so you were really driven in terms of limited, um, this is before the module technology came about, but you were really restricted in terms of when you could pick that cotton. But now with modules, you can pick the cotton at the optimal moment, at its optimal quality, and it can sit there in that module until uh, the ginning capacity opens, it up, opens up to remove the seeds. So, I mean, that's just one of the really thoughtful uh, aspects of technology being applied to this agricultural product to make it its very best. So now I, I have the great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Jeff Elder, who uh, I know we uh, from the cotton industry know very well. As he kind of started literally from the ground up, uh, crawling under a uh, save seed uh, uh, silo to uh, fix uh, some machinery. So he literally started from the ground up and then uh, came to work at uh, the Boswell Organization, marketing Supima around the world to, to Mills, served on the Supima board, was the Supima chairman, and is now with Oratane, which, you know, Mark and I, who have been with Supima for 17 years, uh, we have to thank the board for uh, hiring us directly from elementary school uh, and having the, the, the faith uh, in us to, to fulfill our duties. But honestly, those uh, 17 years, every year was spent trying to find the best way to authenticate Supima, uh, you know, uh, content in a product. And we went through so many different variations looking at, you know, obviously paper trail, and documentation, but looking at DNA testing. I mean, we really, uh, and this was with the full support of our board, you know, went through quite a journey uh, to arrive at this, this very exciting partnership that we've developed with Oratane. And so uh, we're very excited to share that with you today. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Jeff Elder. Thank you, Buxton. Am I on here? Yes, I am. Thank you, Buxton. And um, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Jason, for inviting me here, letting me have this conversation with this good bunch of people. Uh, I am giving a presentation that I call Transparency and Traceability, Why They Need to Be Partners. And I actually gave this on Sunday in Portugal to the international textile manufacturers. And it was fairly well received, so I thought I'd try it again and see if I can win twice. This is actually a picture that Mark Lukowitz took in India. And surprisingly, it was a place called the Cotton Bazaar, but of course, that's not cotton, that's dates. And as Mark was looking at this, he was trying to figure out, what is the difference in the dates in the different boxes? And eventually, the translation got to the point where they're just boxes. There's no difference in the dates. But as Westerners, we're kind of programmed to say a different package means a different product. And sure enough, 30 seconds later, he goes around the corner, and they're selling these boxes. And so the guy was just grabbing boxes and filling them up with dates, and that's the difference here. This is another package. I actually know the, the owners of Fiji Water. And the fact of the matter is you could probably fill that with any clean water around the world, and the consumer would never know. Yet he looks at that package, and he's got an idea, and the idea is this is going to be better water than I could get anywhere else, and I'm willing to spend more for it. And I know the owners, and the owners got into a fight with the, with the country of Fiji, who was going to overcharge them, and they said, if you do that, we'll just move our facilities to a nearby island. So they're still going to call it Fiji water. They're not going to change the name of it. But the fact of the matter is they could get that water from any source. And again, the point is, is that there are things beyond the product that we look at other than just the product itself. And I kind of put that in what we would consider to be transparency. And I'll just read the last sentence here. It says, transparency is operating in such a way that it's easy for others to see what actions are performed. It is defined simply as the perceived quality of intentionally shared information from a sender. And of course, you can't have a presentation without having some kind of a definition of sustainable, so I didn't want to disappoint you. But I do want to look at item number three there. 
able to be upheld or defended. This is a poster of, of Nike. And again, what is Nike talking about there? They're talking something different than just the product that you're buying. They're saying, it's the way we make the product. It's the way that we treat our people. It's the way we treat the environment. It's the way we treat the community. So they're making claims about how they do things that isn't actually just a claim about the product, it's a claim about the company. You have a similar situation with Levi's. And Levi's is saying, hey, we have the Better Cotton Initiative. Well, no offense to Mark, who's chairman of BCI, but the fact of the matter is, is a consumer can go buy BCI cotton or cotton made in Africa, and it doesn't have any BCI cotton in it, and it doesn't have any cotton made in Africa in it. Yet it can still be called BCI. It can still be called cotton made in Africa. Lululemon, sustainability. This is for people who are going to live long, healthy, and fun lives. And we're going to have a healthy planet if we do business with Lululemon. And then this is Respun, how we did it, how we're going to take in all of this, these teas and we're going to recycle these cotton teas. So again, what's happening is people are making claims about their company. But then the consumer sees these kinds of articles. Do we really need any more sustainable fashion? Does sustainable fashion really mean anything? Think Tank, bl the blue truth about sustainability in denim. And then what is sustainable cotton? And what does it mean actually for the farmer? Does that mean that the farmer's making a fair wage? Or does that mean the farmer's not making a fair wage? And up on top, identities such as organic cotton, BCI cotton, and cotton made in Africa are better. Are they really better? We don't know if they're really better because there's really not a lot of good data to say so. And then you have this from Target. Target will not accept any new cost increases related to tariffs on good imported from China. Our expectation is that you will develop the appropriate contingency plans so that we don't have to pass price increases along to our guests. So there's a constant price pressure on the entire supply chain, which leads to people wanting to find ways to cut corners, yet they're going into products that people are saying we're doing things in a very sustainable manner. So from somebody that's been in the cotton trade for his whole life, uh, there's a lot of things that don't add up. And this happens to be the share price of a company that actually um, was mislabeling product with the wrong origin. And if you look at that white line, that represents about $450 million in market cap. And you can see that that company has never quite recovered. So there's a lot of downside risk to making claims that turn out to be unsubstantiated. And I would say that how can you possibly be transparent and say that you can make claims about your product if you don't actually know where your product came from, or if it's determined after the fact that it came from someplace different than what you thought it came from? All of your claims fall apart, and the consumer knows that. And so the consumer is going to know that your claims were not valid because it turned out the product came from someplace else. So now I'm going to talk about traceability. And that's why I think they have to go hand in hand. The company I work for is Oratane. And Oratane has been around since 2008. The technology actually is probably 10 years earlier. So the technology was developed in, of all places, uh, New Zealand, because the University of Ot Otago just happened to be the place where they were developing this. And up until about 2008, it was being used primarily in criminal investigations. So there's a very famous story about a, it's called the torso, but it, it's, it's uh, a boy's body was found in the Thames River, no hands, no head and they were able to take a bone and trace it back to a village in Africa and convict the mother of murder. In 2008, the scientists that were developing this and are still working for the UN decided that there's applications, particularly in New Zealand, to protect their brands. New Zealand wool, New Zealand honey, um, New Zealand kiwis, and that's really where it was developed. And this is how it works. On the left-hand side, you can see that you've got a cotton bowl they're growing, and Underneath, a little difficult to see, but those are trace elements that are found in the ground. These aren't normal elements. These are elements that have been there for millions of years. These are rare elements. And from the air and the, and the, um, and the rain, you get isotopes. So what Ortane does is they, they, um, they verify 42 trace elements and six isotopes. So in order to do this for, for Supima, what we did is we went to every Supima field and we collected a sample of cotton. So if you're going to verify cotton, we need to have cotton. If you're going to verify meat, we would go to a feed yard. If you're going to verify lettuce, you'd go to a lettuce field. So we take the actual product, we test it for trace elements and isotope, 
And that happens to be unique for any other region of the world. And you can say, well, Jeff, how can you say that's unique? And what I would say is, how can you tell me that my fingerprint is unique from every other person in the world? The fact of the matter is, the fingerprint is just about six little lines that are create a figure, and they look at that figure and it's different for every person. What we're doing is we're looking at 42 different elements and six isotopes, and we're creating a diagram that's different from any other place in the world. Once we have the fingerprint in our database, then what we can do is we can sample from anywhere in the supply chain, and that T-shirt's gonna tell us where it came from. And if there's any blending, it's gonna lose its identity, it's gonna lose its fingerprint. Again, the beauty is we first of all don't have to change anything about the way we process. So there is some technology out there that's spraying DNA on cotton. There's other technology where they're putting a, a fiber that can be read in the cotton. In this case, the cotton already has the signature that it needs. And so we can go after the ginning, we can go after the spinning. You know, if you decide, well, I don't want to have to find out that I have a problem and it's already on the retail shelf, I think the problem is after I get the fabric, then we can go to the weaving site and we can test weaving. But we can also walk into a retail store, grab a Supima product, and verify if it's 100% Supima. Oratain has collected samples from 80% of the cotton around the world. So that was an endeavor that they, when they knew that they wanted to expand their textile business, they said, let's just go ahead and find out what the fingerprint is for 80% for of the cotton around the world. And this is a diagram that, that um, kind of depicts it for you. So again, this is a 3D diagram, but we have 42 different layers to this that we can look at. So this is a little misleading, but you can still see that there's great differentiation between Australia, Egypt, USA Supima, and USA Upland. So those circles represent 99% certainty levels. So if the dot falls outside of those circles, we would say that it's not authentic and it's not verified. If it's within those circles, then you'd have Oratane stamp that says, yes, we have proven 99% certainty that this is 100% what it claims to be. In this case, we're just moving into a region. So we were looking at countries, now we're looking at regions. So we have India, but we also have J.G. Boswell Supima, which is one particular farm. We have the Southwest Upland, and we have Sub-Sahara Africa. So again, we can move into regions within that area. And then we can even move within a farm. So in the state of California, the Boswell Company has five districts, and there's enough differentiation, even though those districts are sitting next to each other, there's enough differentiation where you can actually tell which ranch it came from. And to be quite frank with you, this technology is so good that if we wanted to, we could go 50 yards this way on this and, and collect some plants, and 50 yards on that side of the hotel and collect plants and tell the difference between the two. This is a sample test that we did. So what we did is we took um, three samples of blends. One was 90% Boswell, 10% Indian. The other was 50 and 50. And the last one was the other, 10% and 90%. And you can barely see there's three black dots going around that circle. And they're a little bit difficult to see. Does anybody see the three black dots? So what ends up happening is, as the blend moves from the Boswell farm to India, those dots move linearly towards the other destination. So not only, and we didn't know this when we got started, but not only can we tell, oh, by the way, this is not 100% Supima, but we can tell the retailer, this was blended with Indian cotton, or this was blended with Chinese cotton. So we can validate where it came from. And we can do it if it's three countries, if it's four or five that are being blended, it's a little bit more difficult. So when, when a textile mill, like Andy can tell you, when a textile mill um, makes the sliver that you've all seen, they have what's called a laydown. And a laydown tends to be between 30 and 60 bales. So there's a lot of opportunity to blend because that's really what the laydown is for. It's so that you get a consistent cross-section of those bales. So instead of going through a bale this way, you go through 42 bales this way and that gives you that perfect average. So it's easy to blend five countries in, in one single spinning mill. And Supima was the first one to become fit for purpose. So fit for purpose means that we've done enough testing, that we've created a unique fingerprint, we've tested that fingerprint against other regions in the world that might have a similar type product like Egypt, like ELS cotton that's sitting in China, and we now have the opportunity to have a 99% certainty 
that Supima is 100% Supima. And we've had brands that have been very interested in the technology and are taking it up. So you have the Caring Group, Banana Republic, Burberry, L.L. Bean, that's good, Land's End, Gap. So Supima is making claims about their cotton. They're saying it's rare. They're saying it's American grown. They're saying it's authentic and superior. But they're also backing it up by saying we can prove that that's 100% Supima and they're the first organization in the world that can do that and the second organization in the world that's gonna be able to do that is USA Cotton. Authenticity underlies every fiber of Supima Cotton and today it does. And it was a long struggle as Buxton member. When I was chairman of the board of Supima, I gave a lot of money to people that told us that they could accomplish this for us. And we went down that track for 10 years and we finally came up with a technology that works. Uh, um, Ortain also works with New Zealand Wool Association, Australian Beef Association. Uh, they're doing work with crocodile. Um, they're doing work with mohair. Uh, but cotton is certainly uh, a fiber that they're very confident tells the story of where it came from. And our motto is the truth lies within, traceability like no other. And again, the, if this isn't a packaging, it isn't a paper trail, it's that the product itself tells us exactly where it came from, we just have to get it out of the product. And that completes my talk. <laughs> so, we got a lot of time left. <laughs> Who's got questions? Yes, sir. Did I do better than Dent, Ben, or did I not? <laughs> Good. Um, so um, I have a question and then a question. So um, the theory you have is interesting that they um, sort of like create this taste value. So, but how do you then link to like the taste of the milk? So when I have a red milk and I drink. Well, the way that you would prove that the field only produces Supima is one, way, one reason is that it is illegal based on U.S. law and the USDA and the permit bill identification to call something Supima that's not. Second of all, it would be a gross error because, and it is something that happens in Egypt. So in Egypt, they had a big problem in that when the governments were turning over, and I knew the Minister of, of, of Agriculture in Egypt very well, what they do is they designate a place, and they say, okay, this area can only grow this variety, and this area can only grow that variety. Well, when the government started falling apart, the people that had the lower-priced variety would take it over and gin it with the, with the higher variety, and then that seed got intermixed and they destroyed their varieties and they destroyed their cotton and it's taken them four years now to get back to where they can make a fiber that has some validity to it. But I can tell you that that's just not something that's going to happen here. But if you looked at the fiber itself, you'll notice that upland cotton is very much whiter than Pima cotton. It's very much shorter than Pima cotton. So it would become very apparent at the USDA level that that was a blend. And it, and it is more difficult to roller gin upland cotton. So I, I'd let Kirk answer the question, but it would be very unlikely for that scenario to happen, and it would be very noticeable to the blind eye. So let me answer it another way. Let's just, so we've got a program with Caring where we're looking at a, an organic farm in Texas, correct? Can we prove that that's organic? No, we cannot. We are an origin certificate. What we can prove is it comes from that farm, and then you have to trust that farmer that he's growing organic. It's the same situation here. We can prove it came to a, from a Supima farm, but you have to trust that that farmer is growing only Supima cotton. But again, the short fiber content that would come out of the USDA and the, that machinery you'll see tomorrow, it would, it would pull out enough short fibers out of that that it would become very apparent. Any other questions? Uh, 
Uh, if it's two countries, we can get to about 10%. But, but, but you can ask the question, and it's a valid question, well, Jeff, how much blending does it take for you to notice it? And my answer is gonna be very nebulous. My answer is, right now, my phone knows that this is Jeff Elder because of my fingerprint. How much of your fingerprint do we have to put on my fingerprint before Apple says, this is no longer Jeff Elder? It may not know who it is, but it knows this is no longer me. And it's the same thing with here. You put a little bit of blending in and, and it changes those markers enough where it becomes very apparent. We got lots of time. I could be up here all day long. Yes, sir. Listen, I'm going to say something that's controversial that you're not going to like to hear, but it's an absolute truth. We as a human race don't want to live in an organic world. You'd have two to three billion people starving and fighting right now for food because organic does not have the same yield capacity that conventional. That's why people are growing conventional. They don't do it for health. Organic and organic uses in general more pesticide, more water, and more land than conventional grower. The difference is, is the pesticides, and Kirk again can, can speak to this, but the pesticides that are registered in the United States, I mean in California, have to be fairly specific towards the insect that it's going after, and it has to break up in the soil in a fairly rapid manner. Whereas organic, uh, organic pesticides tend to kill everything and tend to hang around longer. Is that a fair statement, Kirk? Yeah. So there are growers that, uh, if you look at uh, Burberry and Caring Group, they both have come out with new management that says we want to be 100% organic. Um, there are growers that are growing organic supima, and they're asking for somewhere between 350 and 450 a pound. And right now, the grower price on regular cotton is about $1.20. So it takes three times as much, and you have to accept whatever quality they make. So the fact of the matter is, is they, they have the chance to, to be feeding insects instead of clothing people. And, and so it's, it has to be an isolated field. At those prices, they tend not to make money, but they're growing vegetables behind that. Maybe they're growing toma organic tomatoes or organic lettuce, and so they're making very good margins on that product. But on the cotton itself, it's still, even at those higher prices, very difficult because um, the fact of the matter, it just doesn't yield well. Yes, sir? I, I, I don't think you ask wealthy people if they like organic. What you ask is the person that's starving for food and putting every dime they have to feed their family, and you ask them, do you like the options of having affordable food? And the fact of the matter is conventional farming is what's giving them affordable food. All right. Hearing none, thank you very much. Jeff, um, you know, we, we really couldn't be more excited to have this uh, tool and this option that we've created. And, and really, this is a tool, an option for you as brands to use uh, because only you know your supply chains. I mean, we, you know, through the licensing program, we do document the supply chain, but you know the schedule for when, you know, production is occurring. You are the ones that know you know, better than we ever could when testing needs to occur. And so in a way, you know, this is a, to a tool and we, you know, are out there, you know, spot checking product on the shelf. This is now fit for purpose and, you know, is in operation. And we use this to go and spot check product that's out there on retail, you know, shelves. But, you know, it's really more for you all to implement. And, you know, if you want to make these claims, you have to, you know, about true transparency, tracing it back to the origin, that's something that, that you as brands and retailers will have to implement and to use it and decide, you know, what is the degree to which you want to implement? Do you want to do, you know, spot checking, as Jeff was referring to, at, uh, at the retail shelf? Do you want to go back and really start, you know, working with your different yarn suppliers and, you know, testing them randomly to flag you know, inconsistencies early on. That's really a, a decision 
for you all to make and to make that judgment in terms of the uh, kind of the uh, robust level of the claims that you want to make. But um, that again is kind of leading back to this partnership that Sapima has with you. We really depend on each other and um, you know, it's been a long journey to create this tool, but we're really excited to work with you and to be able to roll it out in the manner that makes the most sense because it's, this allows you as Supima consumers to be able to tell a true transparency story that no one else can tell. There's lots of claims that can be made. Jeff referred to those in looking at some of the brands. Uh, but now with this tool, you can make a claim and then back it up and not worry that, uh, you know, if you're doing the level of testing, uh, not worry that you're going to be tomorrow's headline and tomorrow's scandal that, you know, this product was mislabeled. It didn't really come uh, from the origin that was, was claimed. Uh, this is a real opportunity for you to, to speak to your consumers uh, in whatever language you think is appropriate and be able to, to back it up. So uh, at this point, we're ahead of schedule. I don't know how many times, I'm sorry, yes. Oh, Jeff, yeah. It is dependent on the question that you ask us. So the reason I say that is that we have to develop a baseline. So when we first decided, when, when I was with the Boswell Company, I, I was the person that found Oratane out of our Australian operation because they were working in New Zealand wool. So we had to map the Boswell farm so we could tell if it was Boswell cotton. Mm -hmm. Then when we decided to move on to Supima, we mapped the Supima ground. And now that we're doing Cotton USA, we've mapped the US cotton. So the larger the region, you still get a single fingerprint that represents that region. If we want to get down to the farm level, then we would have to go and create a baseline because when we take those samples and we do the analysis and we create a database, what we're doing is we're creating a baseline. So if you came to me like a Karen group and you say, I want you to create a baseline for this one farm in Texas that's an organic farm, we can do that. But if I wanted to go between Boswell Farm and its neighbor, Kirk, that would require an awful lot of testing between those, almost as much testing as the United States versus India. I mean, I mean, just just think about the the amount of variability it would be between the soil and and the substrata and the the rare. You know, there's gold in California. There's not maybe gold in India. So if you find gold, it it says this is this works here and it doesn't work there. But between two adjacent farms, that's a lot of testing. It can be done up to a quarter mile, or sometimes even closer to that. But it just requires a lot of, a lot of work. So Jeff, I actually have a question uh, regarding cost, uh, testing cost. I think there were some numbers that were given last week, um, maybe where from $500 to $750 per test, depending on what level of testing is required and what point in the supply chain. Is there any plan to scale up the uh, testing capability, maybe we augmenting the uh, uh, data bank um, that will eventually uh, allow just the cost to be lower so that we can have um, more systematic costs in throughout the supply chain? So the, um, there are three different ways that Orchain makes money. So the first way it makes money is by creating the database. And that's fairly work intensive. So again, we've tested thousands of samples in order to get a fingerprint for Supima. So that was a big cost input. And whoever wants to use that database needs to share in some of that cost across the board. Then we maintain that database every year by testing a lesser amount of samples, but to make sure that, so the first year we were at, at the Boswell Company, we actually was in, were in the middle of a drought. So 100% of our water we were pumping out of the ground. The next year, 
we had a very wet year, so almost all of the water came from the snowpack. So we were worried that based on the aquifer water and the snowpack water, you might have a different fingerprint. And it turned out that it was a similar fingerprint. So there is some maintenance. And then the third part is, like you say, the testing, right? And so it depends on how frequently you want to test. You get better rates based on it. But the actual chemical analysis can be done in labs all over the world. There's a lot of labs out there that can look at something and say what part per billion, part per million, the different elements are, because they're heavier elements, they use magnets, and they just tune it into all these different elements, and then it hits and has misses, and they, can do, and they have a counter on it. What the capabilities of Wartane is, is the algorithm and the statistical model to be able to take that and say, this differentiates this from any place else. And so part of that cost that you're talking about is the actual cost of going to this other lab and getting it through that lab. And then, of course, Ortain is using their sophisticated statistical model. So if there's, if there's more testing, like with a Cotton USA pro uh, program, yeah, it would be, it'd be considerably cheaper. And that's one thing that, um, I mean, there's a wide uh, range of options. I mean, with the Caring Group, they're tracing back to a single farm. Now, that's, I think that, and that's because that's the story they want to tell. But, I mean, that may not be the story that you is really necessary for you. Maybe it's more if you just want to tell that the product is Supima, then that's a much, I mean, that fits right into the mapping that they've already conducted. So, so we've had conversations with Gucci about being able to verify it's Italian leather. So if you go to China and you get a Gucci purse, you can test the leather, and it turns out it's not Italian leather, you know it's a fake. And the worst fear for a company like Gucci's, and then you guys are all retailers, so you know this as well I do, is for there to be a fake in their store. It's one thing, the fake going out the back, but these guys are scared to death that there's a fake in their store. And so this is a way that you could have a verification program. I don't know, I mean, I know you're in initial talks with some of these brands, but maybe you could kind of uh, describe some of the kind of structures for testing that you've discussed with these brands on and levels and where their focus is, whether it's at consumer or across the supply chain, just to provide them some insight. Well, and, and it's a, what it ends up being is a deterrent, right? It's a deterrent. I mean, think about right now what's happening in China. China's the biggest market for Supima cotton, and there's a big tariff and a trade war going on. And China has its own ELS cotton. It would be ripe right now for them to be blending. And I guarantee you, without this program, the tariff, first of all, China has a, 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 a quota system. So the government issues so much import quota. So the, the mill has to say, well, what do I want to do with this import quota? Do I want to buy Supima cotton? Do I want to buy Australian cotton? Do I want to buy Brazilian cotton? So they have a conflict over what foreign cotton they're going to buy. And then in addition now, there's a tariff on that coming in. So there's a lot of motivation for those people to cheat. Well, they can't do that now because we have a deterrent, and we've done a really good job. Supima's done a really good job of letting all of these different manufacturers know, I'm sorry, but now we're going to know that you're blending. And by the way, look at the graph of the company that lost $450 million in seven days. So it becomes a great deterrent. Uh, we're working with people, for instance, that have blockchain. So the World Bank has blockchain on, on, on palm oil. Palm oil is not supposed to come from deforested areas. It's supposed to come from certified areas. So we're helping verify that. But what happens is, is they have a blockchain that does every transaction. And we'll come in every thousandth transaction or 10,000th transaction and verify the blockchain. So the customer really comes up and says, I've got three manufacturers in the world. If I test them once a quarter, I feel very confident that I would catch something. Statistically, I would catch something if they were cheating. And so it depends on what the customer wants and how many different supply chains they have to monitor. Great. Uh, any other questions? Oh, yes, please. <coughs> so with the broad concept of sustainability, just from your experience, and it could be Buxton or Mark or, or you, Jeff, what does, from your opinion, how do you break down the concept of sustainability into um, I guess more specific groups that, you know, something if you say it's sustainable versus like the the fuel that went into transporting this um, cotton from farm to port was an electric vehicle or, you know, just ha where does sustainability go from here to have companies create a system to say part of this piece of our supply chain is sustainable or 
just anything surrounding getting more detail on sustainability? That's a good question, and you know, it. it I, I hate not to be cynical about it because I've traveled all over the world to 30 different countries, and I've seen how cotton and how trucks run in all these different countries, and um, uh, you have to realize that the Western world, because Europe doesn't have its own uh, EPA, the Western, first of all, most of the world doesn't have anything that has to do with an EPA, and I've been in Arumshi, China, and they're burning coal, and they're putting in new coal plants every month, and that's where the cotton's grown. That's where your tomato paste is grown, unless it's grown in California. But, but in general, if you're in Europe or you're in a third, uh, an industrial nation, you use the US EPA as your standard. There's only one place that doesn't have, that has something that's different than the US EPA, and that's California's EPA, where all of these chemicals has to be re-registered here in order to be able to use it here. You can go across the board and you can use them like crazy, but if you come here, you can't. And so I've, I've had meetings with people up in San Francisco and retailers up in San Francisco, and I say, you want to use BCI cotton because you've got 40,000 Pakistani farmers that you're helping to be better farmer, more power to you. But, if, but why don't you just say, let's find out what state of the art is, because I can drive you 100 miles and show you state of the art. And there's no doubt in anybody's mind that goes see the farm that they aren't seeing state of the art. Why don't you say that's state of the art and then compare everything as a gradient to that? Because here it's state of the art. So I know that's not exactly the answer you want, but I mean, it's just like Kirk is saying that he's not using a 40 year old tractor that's blowing smoke out the back. We've begun to talk about our practices because we felt, okay, now we can link the two. Uh, because, you know, as uh, Jeff put in his uh, presentation, you can't speak to sustainability without having transparency. Yes. I'm going to put that over to Mark because Mark, being chair of BCI, has got his own input on this. But I think what's uh, what what your consumer and what you're going to require is that if you say it's BCI cotton, by golly, and I put it on the label, it better be BCI cotton. If you say it's cotton made in Africa, by the golly, I'm, and I put on the label, it better be cotton made in Africa. And so it's the whole mass balance system, I think, is what's going to probably fall apart. So mass balance means if I buy cotton in Africa, I can call a product cotton in Africa even if it's not the same cotton, right? You get credits and then you sell credits and then the credits move on. I think that, that with this technology, we're now going to be getting to the point where we can say, you don't have to do mass balance anymore. You can tell the consumer exactly what he wants to hear. I was uh, chair of the International Textile Manufacturers Joint Cotton Committee when, we, when the BCI said, will you endorse us? And I said, I would endorse you because you're helping growers be better growers. That, that's a good thing because some of these tra tr uh, aid for trade and some of these things cause growers to grow cotton for 10 years and ruin their ground. BCI is coming in and saying you have to have a good rotation. You have to watch how you do your pesticides. Your tra that's all great. The problem is you're telling the consumer it's better cotton. And the cotton itself is some of the worst cotton in the world. Um, it's, and that's the problem with making good products out of it. People say, I want to be 100% sustainable, but if you stick with just BCI, you don't have the quality necessary to make the high quality product. Correct. So, Mark, you want to jump in on that? Am I right in my BCI prediction? <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> yes, I am also the chairman of BCI. Okay. Um, um, so, basically, the mass balance system is is a wonderful opportunity. I'm going to sit down. Is a wonderful opportunity to share a story about trying to do something better, right? It's not tying the, the message directly to a physical bear or to a particular field or farmer. It's about improving the environment for growers such that they have a better chance of having a livelihood, that they find ways of being better growers such that they can improve the yields. But you know, the better cotton name is a little bit confusing because it doesn't physically mean it's physically better cotton. It means it's a better process for growing cotton. So. That's a good thing. You know, one of the challenges is 
you by using better cotton because the BCCUs are disassociated with the fiber, you're then trusting on a supply chain, which is kind of what Buxton and, and Jeff were trying to get to. There's an innate trust that we all have relative to the supply chain, you know, whether it's the fiber that's being used or the yarn that you think you may be getting in the product. We all know that there's cheating going on, right? The textile inherently, the textile industry inherently cheats because there's price pressures where they're being forced to try to find something that works. Or for example, let's say somebody gets a yarn in to make a knit good or a woven fabric. And that yarn hits the mill and all of a sudden they try making a product out of it and it fails because it isn't the quality they need. So then they go out and source. So whatever that was, all of a sudden isn't going to be actually used in the product that the people think they're getting. So it could be a substitution of an Indian cotton for a Pakistani cotton for an Egyptian cotton. And that's one of the things that we saw you know, recently here in the US with the Egyptian cotton labeling fiasco, right? Because even on the Egyptian cotton website, for example, they talk about 90% of the product in the marketplace isn't actually made with Egyptian cotton. It's a huge problem, and that's what we're trying to address with Oritain and getting back to authenticity. How do we proactively engage the supply chain and go back to the point of origin such that we can authenticate the fiber? By authenticating the fiber, that also opens the door to efficiently and effectively being able to talk about sustainability because we can actually say this fiber came from this farm and these are the practices and principles engaged on that farm. It's not just kind of a, you know, not, not to say greenwashing, but it's not like a, a paintbrush effect trying to paint a bigger story because that's all you can do because you don't have that uh, insight into that supply chain. So and let me just add one other thing is that in, in all business enterprises, and we know this is a fact, but it's certainly the fact in textile, is the people that are cheating put everybody else at a competitive disadvantage. And, and that's really what, what gives me a lot of satisfaction is I put an end to that. Because I know that there's been people in Pakistan that have said, I can buy Sukuna yarn from China cheaper than I can buy your Bella Cotton, so why am I buying your Bella Cotton? And I, of course the answer is, well, all you're doing is getting a certificate. And I will tell you a story, one of my favorite stories is from an Indian customer that I respect 100%, but this is what he told me about organic Indian cotton, because 90% of the cotton that is labeled organic is Indian and Turkish, and that's a reason. And he said, listen, Jeff, in India, if you have a son that says, I want a dog for Christmas, you can give the son a cat as long as you give him a certificate that says it's a dog, <laughs> and then he'll be happy. <laughs> and then just finally on, on the certification, you know, I don't think it's something that Supima would get into. There's plenty of other organizations out there trying to do certification. Um, the challenge for them is they don't have the transparency and traceability and um, view into the supply chain. So as much as you know, people talk about dots or blue sign or, or fair trade or anything else, you can't physically prove that the physical actually re is represented by the certificate is actually in that supply chain. I, I do not, is, is Yeah, so something? I'm also an advisor to the board for the Cotton <laughs> Trust Protocol. <laughs> so somehow I get dragged into all these conversations. Um, yeah, so that's, it's a really good question. So I don't know, if is anybody f familiar with uh, Australia's My BMP program? It's been around for 20 years or so. It's a, it's a voluntary engagement program that the growers can participate in. So the Cotton Trust Protocol is a little bit 
based on that, but it has a real technological aspect to it where it actually uses a, uh, a tracking system where the growers today, because of the technology that's available, as they drive their tractors through the field, it gives them a geolocation uh, point of contact relative to what is happening at that field as the tractor goes through. So the transparency and insight that we're going to gain out of that platform is going to be immensely valuable. And obviously it's going to be average. It's not going to be coming down to an individual grower or anything else. But it'll paint a really big picture. And, and Cotton Leeds has been out there for a couple of years in terms of the Australian and U.S. Uh, cotton groups working together in terms of talking about water reduction, soil uh, preservation, um, you know, minimizing uh, pesticides, herbicides, all of those materials. And they already have a good data set, but it wasn't independently verified. So that's where the Cotton Trust Protocol comes in because it'll be this self-reporting, it'll be this independent verified process, but it's also a voluntary program. So the 200 growers that you say are enrolled voluntarily right now, that's the starting point. It's just going to increase year after year and it's going to be coming much bigger. So we do have Supima cotton growers that are enrolled in this cotton trust protocol, but not all Supima cotton growers. It's, it's a logistic process of going out and getting everybody engaged, but you know the, all the bigger farmers will slowly be enrolled in this uh, trust protocol. So the Cotton Trust Protocol is going to be kind of averaging across the U.S. anyway. Um, he yeah, so you will have growers that are in California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas. You'll have growers from Ari um, Georgia, Tennessee, Mississippi, um, Alabama, and Florida. Uh, so these growers are, are kind of all spread out through the region. And the way it's being rolled out, because it's been rolled out at the National Cotton Council meeting, uh, and that's where the first push is. Typically, the growers that are in, in, typically engaged with the industry, they're the ones that are already on the bleeding edge trying to be more engaged, trying to be better stewards of, of the industry, better stewards and representatives of the grower communities, the gin communities, the merchant communities. So these are the people that are going to be the first adopters of the CTP. It's going to take time to filter down. So I can't say they're going to be I don't know how you qualify the best because it's variable. Each region has its own unique metrics that are challenges. So in Arizona and, and California, water is a more challenging issue than it will be in Florida in where you get plenty of rain. But because you get the natural rain in that environment, it makes it really difficult to manage the crops too because you can't shut the plant down. It's getting more rain. It's just growing big. So then they have to uh, apply growth regulators to slow the plant growth down. So they're going to have unique differences throughout the different growing regions. So I don't know how you qualify. Well, well and I also say that it, and, and again, I'm speaking on behalf of the farmers here, but no two seasons are the same. So for instance, if you end up having three weeks of weather in California and the temperature goes down to 27 degrees, you're not going to have a lot of insects the next year, right? If you have a mild, mild winter like we did last year, if you have a lot of growth up in the foothills, you're going to have a lot of insects. So the barometer changes continuously depending on where you're located, what the weather pattern was in that area, what the, in, what the, what the insect pressure is. It, it was different this year in the southern end of the valley than it was in the northern end of the valley. So they had a lot of bug pressure south and not so much north. So those metrics change all the time. I think it'd be very difficult to sit there and grade one, one grower against the next because they're all fighting for the same thing. They're all trying to be as efficient as they possibly can. And the, and the other thing too is even when you have, you know, within a region, you know, one year you're going to have a great yield, yield, another year is going to be a bit of a challenge just because maybe the heat units aren't there or you get a hot spike in the middle of the summer so you drop some bowls because the plant really struggles and stress and you can't get water back onto the plant quickly enough or it's not available. Um, so you know, when you're talking about you know, responsibility and sustainability and, and efficiency, you know, those yield fluctuations, even despite your best efforts, you can't control it. It's still Mother Nature. So 
there's going to be flexibility and variability in the results year after year. But what we've seen over the data that's already been collected you know, over the last 20 years in the US, you have these spider diagrams where you have this contraction of efficiency where you see that there's w less water being used. So I think the, the, um, the Cotton Leeds program has indicated that there was a 50% water reduction in the last 15, 10 or 15 years. That's huge, right? If you can reduce, continue to improve upon that, and as you have more stewardship coming in where you're finding better ways of managing the water. So there's growers that are doing alternate row furrow irrigations, or you have the uh, you know, uh, drip irrigation. And there's different types of drip irrigation. There's surface uh, drip tapes. There's drip tapes that you put on the ground. And because of the farming technology with the GPS, you can run your tractors over those certain furrows and keep that drip tape down there. So all of a sudden that becomes more sustainable because you're not ripping up drip tape. You're not wasting that to become more efficient, right? So those are other things that are happening you know, in the backgrounds that we just generally don't see as, as a, as a consumer-facing story. All right, well, uh, actually, um, uh, I think we're, we're running a little bit over time. Um, so I'd like to thank our presenters today for sharing all this information. I'd like to thank our audience for all the great <laughs> questions and conversations. And so we'll, we'll break for lunch. We're going to the Topiary Gardens. We'll get to uh, go outside, enjoy the beautiful California weather. And I, I did have a few questions from people about uh, our last session uh, at the end of the day, great big story. And so at that point, uh, uh, we'll be standing up here at the, at the front, uh, just in front of the stage, and I'll have a uh, product from each of our participating brands uh, at the front, and I'll just ask the representatives from each brand to come up and just uh, tell, quickly tell about each product and then share one fun fact that nobody would know about this special product you've created with Sapima and we'll try to keep it to two or three minutes, but that'll allow everyone to get up and, and share about the special product they've created with Supima. So, uh, Topiary Garden, uh, we'll have lunch till 1 p.m. We'll reconvene then. Thank you. <laughs>